This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you very much, Keith, and thank you and congratulations for organising uh, today. I'm going to summarise a full-length paper which I've written describing Nelson Mandela's relationship to the South African Communist Party at the vital moment in the early 1960s when the guerrilla army Mkonto was Siswe, which was later to become the official armed wing of both the SACP and the ANC, was conceived and created. So I'm summarising along the paper and you will understand that I can't present all my evidence in a relatively short time. I'll begin with um, a, a brief description, which may not be necessary in present company, but let me do it anyway. A brief description of the ANC and the anti-apartheid organizations in mid-20th century South Africa. The ANC had been open to black Africans of any political persuasion ever since its foundation in 1912. This included black people who were also members of the Communist Party of South Africa, known as the CPSA, whose membership grew quite fast in the 1940s. In 1950, when South Africa's National Party government introduced legislation to ban the Communist Party, the CPSA dissolved itself. Now, in order to continue uh, their political activity legally, Communists joined other groups, so black communists were working inside the ANC, Indian communists inside the Indian Congresses, and so on. In 1953, veterans of the defunct CPSA secretly refounded their party under a new name, the South African Communist Party, the SACP, and unlike its predecessor, this was uh, an underground party. Meanwhile, the ANC allied itself to other anti-apartheid groups, including the Indian Congresses and the Congress of Democrats, which was created by white communists in 1952 as a legal front organization in an arrangement known as the Congress Alliance. Nelson Mandela, who in earlier years had argued against allowing communists to join the ANC, by this time thought that South Africans of all backgrounds should work together in opposition to apartheid. Mandela, at that period, was becoming more militant in his political views. When his close friend Walter Sisulu was invited to Eastern Europe in 1953, talent spotted by members of the new Communist Party, Mandela urged Sisulu to continue to Beijing and to seek Chinese support for the armed struggle. Sorry, I'm sure, sorry, for an armed struggle. The Chinese government was non-committal. Mandela considered that violence was legitimate in support of a just cause. A noteworthy passage in the memoir that Mandela wrote in Robben Island Prison in the mid-1970s, which was to serve as the basis for the well-known autobiography that he published in 1994, concerns the morality of using violence in politics. I'm quoting from the uh, prison manuscript, which is slightly different and in interesting ways from the published autobiography. Mandela concludes in the passage, the relevant passage, that if violence will advance the struggle, I quote, then it must be used whether or not the majority agrees with us. This begs the question of who is to decide what constitutes progress in any struggle. We will see, or I will shortly explain, that Mandela was influenced by the Communist Party's view that the correct policy in any given situation may be determined by reference to the quasi-scientific method of Marxism-Leninism. The SACP was proud of its role in providing direction to the Congress Alliance. The party's leading theoretician, Michael Harmel, wrote, I quote, the building of the United Front of National Liberation was the main direction of the party's activities before 1960. A younger party member, Bob Heppel, found that the South African Communist Party, in fact, I quote, engaged in no independent activities whatsoever, working exclusively within other organizations. The SACP had a particularly notable effect in informing ANC members of international affairs. The SACP's view on this matter included the perception that the Soviet Union was in favor of world peace and the emancipation of colonized peoples everywhere, 
and that colonies belonged to capitalist powers only. This was an opinion that Mandela came to share. The SACP's worldview at that time, and for many years to come, was rooted in a Stalinist interpretation of Marxism-Leninism. As Ronnie Casrills wrote, we saw Ronnie Casrills being interviewed in the film this morning, as Ronnie Casrills wrote, I quote, ideological development in our party marked time at 1917 and then at 1945. Even the exposure of uh, Stalin's crimes by Khrushchev in 1956 failed to shake the basic ideological position of the old guard. So I can summarize what I've just been saying by saying that before 1960, Nelson Mandela was a militant senior leader of the ANC in the Transvaal. He had thought for years, by 1960, that an armed rising would one day become inevitable. He knew this would need international support. He had developed close friendships with members of other anti-apartheid organizations, including the Communist Party. He was strongly influenced by his relations with communists and by Marxist literature. He wrote, I was to embrace dialectical and historical materialism as my philosophy. He came to see the Russian Revolution of 1917, and I quote from his prison memoir, as an immortal achievement which opened up vast possibilities for man's forward movement. After the Sharpeville killings in March 1960, Mandela, like many other people, sensed that the moment to take up arms had arrived. Some, but not all, leading members of the SACP were coming to the same conclusion and their party formally debated changing its policy on the question of violence. The Communist Party's work inside other organizations had been so effective that in July 1960, two senior SACP officials, Yusuf Dadu and Vela Pile, wrote to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, quote, that all important positions and direction in the Congress movement and in other organizations are occupied by members of our party. In the African National Congress, this is particularly the case. The policy of the African National Congress is therefore heavily influenced by our party. That's in July 1960. They and two other SACP delegates traveled to Moscow where they seem to have received at least unofficial assurances of support for an armed struggle. From Moscow, Dadu and Pile traveled to Beijing where they met Chairman Mao Zedong in person on the 3rd of November, 1960. He promised support for a military struggle. The views of those SACP militants most in favor of a turn to armed struggle were aired at a national conference held by the South African Communist Party in Johannesburg in December, 1960. The conference, attended by about 25 people, passed a resolution instructing the party's central committee to prepare for an armed struggle. Nelson Mandela was one of those present. Bob Heppel, who also attended, recalls being told that Mandela had been invited as an observer. Mandela, I quote Heppel's words, was not one of the district committee delegates, nor had he been a member of the central committee during the time up to December 1960 when I was co-opted to it. I do not know if Mandela was co-opted to the Central Committee after the December 1960 conference. Several other members of the party have claimed that he did become a member in 1960. At least eight senior members of the SACP of those days have said, written or hinted that Mandela indeed joined the party around that time. Bob Heppel finds it, I quote, entirely credible that Mandela was co-opted onto the Central Committee to work closely with Joe Slovo, Walter Sisulu and others in establishing Umkonto with Sizwe at or immediately after the SACP's December 1960 National Conference. It was standard procedure for a national conference to elect only part of a new central committee, following which those openly elected proceeded to co-opt further members whose names were not communicated to conference delegates or to the party at large. The SACP's December National Conference marked the true starting point, in Bob Heppel's words, of Umkonto Wasizwe. The fact that Mandela was present 
meant that he was one of the handful of people who knew about the party's decision on armed struggle from the outset. He was presumably aware also of the promises of support obtained from China and most probably from the USSR as well. All this means that we can no longer take at face value the traditional account of how the ANC adopted its new army and contour with Sizwe. The traditional account, based largely on Mandela's own statement at his trial before the Supreme Court in Pretoria, is that Mandela led a campaign by ANC and militants to persuade their organisation's National Executive Committee to adopt a policy of armed struggle in a sequence of clandestine meetings in the middle of 1961. However, it is apparent that Mandela and his fellow militants were not entirely successful in those efforts. The most that they could get was recognition so that some members of the ANC were intent on forming an organization dedicated to armed struggle and an agreement that those who joined this new body should not be expelled from the ANC. Joe Slovo confirmed years later that the ANC's president, Albert Lutuli, I quote, was not a party to the, to the decision to create Umkonto with Sizwe, nor was he ever to endorse it. When Nelson Mandela and the other Rivonia trialists were convicted in 1964, Lutuli, who was still the ANC's president at that time, wrote to the United Nations Security Council that, I quote, the African National Congress never abandoned its method of a militant, non-violent struggle. According to Mandela's colleague, Mac Maharaj, by the time Mandela approached the ANC's national executive in mid-1961, with a suggestion that it adopt a policy of armed struggle, the SACP had already gone on to form sabotage units of its own. Maharaj recalls that Mandela contacted the party saying, and I'm quoting Maharaj, but Maharaj is sort of reconstructing uh, the conversations that would have gone on. So uh, it, Maharaj recalls that Mandela contacted the party saying, you've got squads. Can we sit down and talk about how we get about this problem? Mandela was already talking to ANC members whom he thought might be good recruits for a, an, a, an armed force. Maharaj continued, the two, that is to say the SACP and Mandela, the two merged their squads into the formation of Umkonto Wasiswe. They agreed that they could not be two separate structures. It seems then that Mandela was actively working with existing SACP sabotage groups with a view to fusing them into one body with his own ANC volunteers from July 1961, but with only equivocal, only equivocal support from the ANC leadership. In late 1961, a national leadership of Umkonto Wasiswe was established, composed of six people, three serving on behalf of the South African Communist Party, three on behalf of the ANC. However, according to ANC documents, I'm sorry, however, according to SACP documents, at least five of the six were SACP members. This national command then established regional commands, but according to an SACP memorandum written probably by Joe Slovo, I quote, in all cases, the effective control is in the hands of members of the party. The author of this document, probably Joe Slovo, insisted that, I quote, the overall strategy and direction of policy of Umkonto Wasiswe remains at all times in the hands of the leadership of the party. Thus, Mandela's insistence that he was not only the first chairman of Umkonto Wasiswe's national command, but also the organization's real founder, and that the SACP played only a minor role, has to be reconciled with the fact that Mkonto Wasiswe was originally conceived by a resolution of the Communist Party at a national conference, and that party chieftains were adamant that they controlled it. To some extent, differing interpretations may be due to the intermingling of different organizations. When Bob Heppel was appointed to the secretariat of the SACP <coughs> Central Committee, he, I quote, quickly concluded that the whole setup was blurred 
that at the top, the party and the ANC, the Central Committee of the former and the National Executive of the other were virtually as one and the same, indivisible from Mkonto Wasizwe. According to Ben Turok, I quote, few, if anyone, knew the entire membership of the South African Communist Party. The party's constitution allowed for the expulsion of any member who disclosed the fact of his or her membership. When Mac Maharaj was asked about Nelson Mandela's party membership, he said, and I quote, when I discussed it with Mandela and Sisulu in prison, they came to me on their own, and the one said, that would be Walter Sisulu, the one said, if I die, whatever the repercussions, then reveal it. The other, that would be Mandela, states his position that in view of the positions he has taken in court, which was a collective decision, then began to bend it in his autobiography to say he believes in the philosophy of dialectical materialism, but now again, there are problems there. That's quoting uh, Mac Maharaj, who is not entirely clear in those statements. What can be said with confidence is that Mandela was effectively a part of the South African Communist Party's governing body by 1962. Both the South African Communist Party and the ANC separately confirmed this publicly uh, after his death. In ideological terms, the most important element of SACP membership was a commitment to the eventual triumph of a socialist revolution that would see the proletariat take power through its representative, the Communist Party. This appears to have been the one key point on which Mandela diverged from the party, since his prime commitment was to the liberation of the black population of South Africa. In the end, this was the one thing separating him from full Marxist-Leninist orthodoxy. It was perhaps typical of the imperious Mandela that he assumed that his own ideology prevailed in all his, meeting, all his dealings with the party, even when he sat in Central Committee meetings, just as he insisted that he was the true instigator of Mkonto with Sizwe, despite knowing that it had been conceived by a party resolution. What is a historian such as myself, what is a historian to do in these circumstances? Surely the proper course of action is to study the historical record as carefully as possible and as far as possible without regard to one's own ideology. As Eric Hobsbawm noted, we have, I quote, we have a responsibility to historical facts in general and for criticizing the politico-ideological abuse of history in particular. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Stephen. Perfectly surprised.